going to start off with the, the three presentations here today talking about uh, influenza virus prevalence and factors in weaning age pigs. Um, most of the presentation here is going to talk about the first point here and I'll, I'll get into some of the um, objectives of this study. So to start things off for the day, I know we'll have a couple other presentations here on flu, so just a, a brief introduction slide here. Um, we talk about influenza virus in pigs, we're talking about influenza virus type A. Um, some of the other nomenclature things as we go forward here. Uh, so influenza virus is our subtype based on HA and NA. Uh, in pigs, the, mo the most common subtypes being H1N1, uh, H1N2, and H3N2. Can also go further and, and classify these viruses by um, differing clusters, um, including our, our nomenclature there for H1, so alpha, beta, gamma, delta, um, and, and so on for H3s. Um, so just a, a brief overview slide here of, of influenza virus. As we know, influenza viruses are a common cause of, of disease in many animal species, including pigs, um, also humans, and, and we can have transmission events between these different species. And that, that's certainly been highlighted uh, recently over the, the past few years, um, 2009 with our pandemic H1N1, um, and also some of the variant H3N2 viruses and, and others at that point in time. Uh, in, in pigs specifically, so the focus of the, the session here, um, important viruses because they are a cause of respiratory disease in pigs, um, leading to the, the last point I have there, an, an economic impact on pig producers, production, frustrating for, for veterinarians, uh, et cetera. Uh, second point there is also when we find these viruses in pigs, we always need to consider that there is the potential for a transmission event from pigs to other animal species, in, including humans and caretakers within our barns. Talked a little bit about the economic impact there. Um, I think in comparison to some of our other diseases, we, we lack um, a few of these estimates in influenza virus. This is one of uh, the more recent estimates regarding the economic impact of influenza viruses in pigs. Um, this would be in, in grow finish specifically. Uh, $3.23 difference from baseline uh, with influenza infection. We look at combination of influenza and PERS and we see significantly higher estimate there as, as we'd expect, and, and we'd expect this to you know, occur fairly commonly in the field as well. So just to put a number of things as we start to talk about later here today in this presentation about the, the prevalence of influenza virus, start to you know, keep some of these estimates in your, in your mind. Just included here a, a few of the historical estimates regarding uh, influenza virus prevalence. Uh, historically, a lot of these estimates would be based on, on seroprevalence, uh, so the first three studies that I've indicated here from the United States, uh, we see seroprevalence, late 70s, uh, early 2000s here, ranging from 20% uh, to 50%. There, there was also quite a bit of variability depending on where samples came from in the United States um, within those studies. Uh, so fairly high prevalence there when we look at seroprevalence. Um, at the herd level, kind of same thing here from, from a couple areas outside the United States. Um, fairly high herd level seroprevalence to influenza virus. Uh, one more recent study here in an active surveillance project uh, looking at uh, prevalence of influenza virus in growing pig herds. Um, one of the, the bigger take-homes from that is, is of those herds in that study of those sites, 91% of those uh, tested influenza virus positive at least once, and that was over a, a sampling duration of a one to two year period. Um, at those sites. So, so the major focus of the presentation today is going to be on weaning age pigs and sow farms, uh, but, but keep that number in mind in terms of, of the percentage of growing pig sites that tested positive in that study. So I showed a bunch of uh, prevalence estimates there. One, one thing I like to throw out there and, and to keep in mind is, is what we're looking at when we talk about prevalence. So prevalence is a combination of incidence of disease and duration of that disease. So if we look at the herd level, we could see a high prevalence to influenza virus if we have high incidence of disease. So we have a lot of new cases of influenza virus infection at the herd level. And secondarily, it could also be because we have a long duration of infection at the herd level. Uh, so a combination of those two. So just schematically thinking there, we have our grow finish herd, our sow, our sow herd here. Do we see high, high prevalence because we have a bunch of new viruses entering these sites? Um, or is it because we have viruses within those sites that maintain themselves over time with, with a longer duration of infection? So I'm quoting our chair of the session here, Dr. Tor Morell, uh, from her 2011 uh, Lehman Conference presentation, and I think some of the things that has led to some of these research projects and some of the take-homes from, 
from that presentation where we should not ignore influenza virus. And I think we've certainly seen over the past few years the intensified research into influenza virus and in pigs specifically. And then secondly there is, is to take a PERS-like approach. So first of all, as I showed those economic estimates there is to, to see how much flu is costing us. And I think if we do look into that, we will see that it's probably costing more than, than we think it is. Um, secondly, to address flu at the, the top of the production chain, so we'll start at the, the sow farm level or the gilt level, and, and one of the reasons why a lot of the work you're going to see today is at the sow farm level. And then last of all, of course, to, to understand where the viruses came from and to understand some of this information regarding prevalence. So we started at, at the sow, heart, sow farm level. Uh, one of the first questions we had is if we go into a, a influenza infected sow farm, where can, we, where can we find virus within that sow farm? Um, this is one example from that study just to illustrate that point. Um, day of sampling here along the left, so we sampled roughly on a monthly basis um, our, our different populations within that sow farm, so sows, gilts, um, young pigs, and, and our older weaning age group of pigs. And um, repeatedly from, from these farms we would see that we, we did not detect influenza virus in our sour gilt populations. Um, and then when we look and sample in our pig population, specifically our uh, weaning age group of pigs is where we, we tend to find that influenza virus in those farms. Uh, most of these were, so th th it is biased in the sense that we selected these farms that had kind of a historical problem. Um, these were not acute breaks. You would expect probably in, in acute breaks that you would find you know, positive animals in these populations. Just to further illustrate that point in terms of um, the population we're focusing on, this is from that um, previous table I showed there. This is our age distribution and days of our pig population, so from three days of age until weaning age, um, those that were tested and were flu negative, those that were tested and were flu positive, and we see we tend to have those cluster right around our, our weaning age of about uh, 20 days of age. Um, also within these populations, uh, one other point is that, so these are ELISA uh, SN ratios. We collected serum um, from these different populations in these herds as well, and so the are ELISA here, so higher, um, negative, lower positive, we see that all these populations within these sites were seropositive. Um, so just to kind of put into context the, the results that we're finding there in, in seropositive populations. And, and lastly, when we talk about controlling influenza, um, just wanted to illustrate the point when we talk about sow farms, uh, some of our historical estimates here on, on vaccination. We see that vaccination is fairly common within, within sow farms, within large sow farms, vaccination of, of breeding herd. Uh, females is fairly common in, in comparison to a growing pig vaccination. So to move into this specific study, the, the major objectives of this study were to one, um, assess the prevalence and temporal patterns of infection at the sow herd level in weaning age pigs specifically, two, to then characterize those viruses obtained within those sow farms, and then last of all, to evaluate the associations um, at the sow herd level to our, our weaning age pig uh, results. The, what I'm going to share today are these first two points, and then this um, last point will be, will be coming down the road in terms of a risk factor analysis from these results. So a little bit on, on the methods for this study is, um, in total, we had 52 sow farms that were uh, involved in this specific study. Uh, these were all farrow to wean sow herds um, that had, at, at some point, either in the gilt population, um, weaning pigs, um, sows, a history of influenza virus infection. Um, and, and also limited this to sow farms, so herds that were not closed, so have replacement gilts um, in entering those sow farms. Um, in the end, these 52 sow farms were across eight different production systems and uh, six different states in, in the United States. Our, our methods is um, the sow farm personnel collected 30 nasal swabs uh, roughly on a monthly basis. Um, and the results that I'm sharing today will have three to six sampling events uh, per each one of these sow farms. Uh, samples were tested by PCR, a subset isolated, and uh, HA sequencing. And the results that I'll show today are HA sequences that were compared within farm from these sow herds. So to jump into kind of the, the big picture of the results at this point, we had uh, 52 sow farms enrolled. Um, of those, 44% of those 52 sow farms have tested positive uh, for influenza virus at least once. And, and this is based on our, our monthly sampling of, of 30 nasal swabs. Uh, secondly, of, of our 252 sampling events, we see that 26% of those monthly sampling events 
um, have at least one influenza virus sample as, as being positive. And then on the lowest level here of our, of our samples that are tested, 2,520, 15% of those have, have tested positive. To look at, at the results at the, at the lowest level here, um, so of our, our 10 pools within each one of these farms, uh, we see a, a pretty wide distribution of the number of pools that tested influenza positive. Uh, we see our, our biggest subset here, so of those sampling events that were negative, um, close to 75% of those. Uh, but we do see in certain cases that you know, all, the, all the samples within that, those, those 10 did test positive. So we see a, a pretty big wide distribution there. We also see the case where we just have, have one positive in that case. So to orient you to this figure, these are the, the 52 sow farms enrolled um, in this study. So starting here with farm number one through 26, and then our second column here, farm 27 through 52. Uh, so for these results, if there's a box and it's green, that farm was tested and tested negative. If red, that farm was tested, was positive. And for, this, for purposes of this diagram, I've just shown if it's an H3 or H1 virus. And then those in white, um, this, it has either, we just don't have the results for this yet or will be uh, conducted in the future. Um, and then the, the few of these yellowers where we had um, all samples were negative and we had say one suspect sample within that sampling event. Um, so a, few, a, for, a couple things to, to look at um, right away at this slide. Number one, um, if farms tested positive at their initial sampling event, they tended to test positive at at least one other sampling event. Uh, second thing to take home is if farms tested negative then at that first sampling event, they tended to test negative um, throughout the, the sampling duration. Of course, we do have a few in here that, that don't meet those criteria, um, but just a couple take homes from this. And you can see just the, the change across sites and, and what we saw overall for this study. Uh, so a few of those other, uh, other points is that our gene sequencing, so this is all based on HA sequencing, uh, were similar across sampling events within farm. Um, so to go over this table here quickly, we had 17 farms in which we had HA sequences, sequences from at least two sampling events. So we were, we were able to compare those sequences within farm over those, over those multiple sampling events. So those 17 farms are here on the left. Um, the count of HA sequences that were compared here in the second column. So we have a range of farms where we compared two HA sequences, and then we have a few here where we've compared up to six HA sequences uh, within that farm, um, so each of their monthly sampling events. Um, here's just the subtype. You can see a, a diversity of subtypes, H1 and H3, across these 17 farms. And then the last column, really the most important here, is, is comparing the lowest percent identity uh, between all of these sequences that were compared. Uh, so, so just as, as an example, these three farms here, we had six within each farm, we had six HA sequences compared, um, the H subtype, and then this is the lowest percent identity between those six uh, monthly sampling events. So we can see that across that far column, across all of our farms, is that the sequences tended to be similar um, all the way across all these sampling events. Uh, we did have three south farms, the ones that I've highlighted here, that, that tested positive for um, six consecutive sampling events. Uh, over durations of approximately 160 days. And then the last point there as well is that I'm comparing within farm at this case, but we also certainly did see differences across farm. So within farm, we tend to have similar viruses, but there is a, a diversity of viruses across these south farms within the study. So a few of those major take homes is that 88% of those south farms that tested flew negative at the first sampling event, continued to test negative throughout. So there, there's something within those farms where they continue to test negative. And then in contrast to that, 84% of those sow farms that tested positive at that first sampling event tested positive on at least one additional sampling event. And then we had those three sow farms uh, where we have, I guess the luxury of this study is where we have multiple sampling events. We were able to show these farms tested flu positive uh, consecutive sampling for approximately 160 days in these, in these cases. So a, a few discussion points from uh, the work of this study and, and previous study. Um, weaning age pigs appear to be an important population for influenza virus epidemiology in general. Um, also are, are a good population for influenza virus testing. Um, they appear to be important for maintenance of influenza virus within herds and therefore as weaning age pigs transport to distant sites. So when we start to think about regional dissemination of influenza viruses, uh, this would be a, an important population to focus on. 
within this specific study, our, our sampling events were fairly repeatable over time. Farms tended to test positive over time and with similar viruses each month. Um, and, and really illustrating the point then that sow herds are an important population, uh, both for studying influenza virus epidemiology and important for virus diversity in, in pig populations. Uh, when we talk about dissemination, so weaning age pigs, um, obviously we have a lot of regional movement with this age population. Uh, so transport of, of influenza virus via weaning age pigs is, is likely an important route of, of flu movement. Um, this, this has been shown uh, that dissemination tends to follow swine movement. So a, a paper here by Martha Nelson and others showing that the spatial dissemination of a specific uh, cluster of influenza virus in North America. So an important thing to, to keep into consideration when we, we think about influenza epidemiology. So just, you know, an example to that point, we have, let's say, one of these sow farms, 3,000 head sow farm, weaning 1,200 pigs per week over, a, let's say, a, a positive duration of three months. If we consider those pigs to be positive for that three-month period, you know, we have 15,000 pigs that, let's say, maybe go to 10 different sites. And I mean, you can, you can pick any number you want there, but just illustrating the point that these pigs are, are likely to move out and are, are probably likely important in the spatial dissemination of influenza viruses. As, as I mentioned earlier, we have um, our, our testing data at this point. Um, still to come, we have we have information on the following, or we'll have information on the following for all of these sow herds, um, things such as, as vaccination, what protocols are used within these sow farms, uh, filtration status, um, how are gilts introduced to these sow farms, um, and then lastly, things like pig density in the area. Just a few limitations to wrap up on this, on, on this data. Uh, farm selection within this study was, was not random, so it was a convenient sample um, of those herds that were willing to be part of this study and, and collect samples as part of this study. Um, due to the, the duration of this study, we weren't able to look at seasonality, um, so all these samples were generally collected in the, the same time of year across all these farms. And then the, the gene sequence comparison at, the, at this point would be was based on here HA sequence comparison. Uh, we know looking at other genes, we may see um, other things than what we saw just based on HA, and, and those could be important for other reasons. Lastly, and, and you know, most importantly here, I'd like to acknowledge our, our funding and support for this project. Um, I think it was, it was a nice collaborative approach to answer some important questions. Mm -hmm.